Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories, bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. Hat tip to our colleague at The Athletic, Rob Rossi, for getting the exclusive. Sidney Crosby is nearing a contract extension with the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, the news dropping very early Monday morning. Uh, we did talk about the topic uh, just before the weekend, and now another leg has been added to that story. CJ, what are you hearing on that topic? Well, I would advise you to go back to Thursday's show and delete it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> although, to be oh, fair, man. Oh. we were not, we were not reporting it. anything. We were just... No. We just it, that was one of those days, and, and the 100 percenters will know that preparation is not my strong point. We just veered into this conversation. It was literally just two guys, Julian and I, chatting about hockey, and we went down that rabbit hole and angered all of the Penguins fans, and some of their reporters seemed to take it quite personally. Um, but it was not like a report. It was just more like, hey, guys, it's after July 1st, and Sidney Crosby hasn't signed yet. What's going on there? Um, <laughs> But Rob Rossi is, 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 you know, locked in on that beat as they come. He's covered the Penguins since Sidney Crosby was chosen first overall in 2005. So uh, certainly have no reason to doubt his reporting. You know, important to note, nothing at this point is done, done. And until, you know, you can be making progress until you don't in a contract negotiation. Although I have no reason to believe if, if both sides on this one are, are confident, they're going to reach a deal that they won't be able to. And, and so this frames it up. The, this is the opposite chat of what we, 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 we went down door a last time. This is door B. This is now Sidney Crosby, you know, approaching his 37th birthday in August. So before he plays his next NHL game, you know, signing what may be his final contract as an NHL player, quite possibly. I mean, we all, I think hope that he can play well into his forties, but you know, we'll see what his body allows, where his mind's at. And so the fact he's going to sign this extension now kind of, confirms i would think i mean it can always be traded of course but i you know i think it's this would be his moment if he was if he had any of the thoughts that we were putting into the universe that he might want to leave this this would confirm i think that that that's not going to happen so um you know it's it's a legacy type of deal it puts the to me it shifts more pressure i'm not saying kyle dubas in the front office didn't feel pressure already but it does shift more pressure to do everything they can to at least try to get this team back to the playoffs at some point during the, the period of time where Crosby's still an NHL player, uh, which I think is going to be a tall ask. Uh, the Metropolitan Division isn't shaping up to be necessarily all that stout, but, you know, the Devils, I think, will be improved. I don't see the Rangers going anywhere from where they've been. You know, the Flyers, you would think, are going to take some steps. Like, like it's, it's not going to be easy. Um, you know, Carolina looks poised maybe to take a step back, but I mean, they've been a top five NHL team for a number of seasons. Now, even if they take a small step back, still probably a playoff team. So Pittsburgh's got to find its way back into that mix. And, and, you know, with Crosby signed and, and obviously Malkin and Latang still there, the trade for Eric Carlson last summer, you know, you have those players, you, you can't be, you can't be a seller at the deadline next year with the way they were this last season. Is this the contract where Sidney Crosby gets an AAV above eight point seven million? Yes, I mean he's he's done the organization a, a favor. I would say. I mean, look, it worked for both parties because he wanted, you know, I think that they, he's always had a great relationship with that organization, right? I know it's it's shifted ownership here in the last couple of years to Fenway Sports Group, but you know, for most of Crosby's career, it was a team owned by Mary Lemieux and Ron Burkle. I mean, you'll recall that Crosby spent the first three or four seasons of his NHL career living at Mario's house. Um, you know, I think that that they they had an unusually close relationship, you know, right to the top of the organization, to the superstar. And so they were able to work together to make things work that that, that both sides could live with. You know, Crosby's going to play a 17th straight season next year with that $8.7 million cap hit. That's allowed Pittsburgh to be aggressive over the years of his prime, uh, reach four Stanley Cup finals be a perennial playoff team until they miss these last two years. But, you know, this is a different kind of contract. And, and you know, it's it's kind of crazy that Crosby is going to retire and never have been the highest paid player in any given season in the league. I mean, that's 
that's kind of nuts when you think about it, given that he's certainly he's, he's either Mount Rushmore or Mount Rushmore light on, on anyone's all time NHL players list. I mean, in terms of certainly a top six, seven player, I would think on like anyone's list. And you could probably make a case to have him a little higher than that. Um, and he grew up in the salary cap era. Like that's the other thing. I mean, what a player made in 1993, 94 mattered to their accountant and their families, but it didn't necessarily matter in the big picture, the same way it's mattered since 0405 uh, when the lockout introduced the hard salary cap. And that was, you know, right when Sidney Crosby got drafted first overall. I mean, this, this, this era of the league, you know, starting in 05, it, 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 the rules were brought in that you could only make up to 20% of the cap. And Crosby never did that despite being, you know, coming in as a generational hype, you know, get a hundred points in his first season. Um, I know he dealt with some injury issues in those first five, six years in the league, but like immediately delivered on his promise, took the Penguins to the cup in his third season, his fourth season, they won. Um, the fact that, that he somehow comes through his whole prime and it wasn't the highest paid player is kind of, kind of wild. So I would think now with, you know, many players, uh, making eight figures that, that being 10 million or up, I, I would expect Crosby's next deal will, will, will at least be in that range. I, it's, you know, I don't get any sense he's pushing to become the highest paid player in the league at this stage, but you know, there is an opportunity to make money here. And let's not forget, he's coming off a 40 goal, 90 point season at age 36. I mean, this is, he was a special player at 18. He remains a special player at 36. Is there something to the fact that we're hearing about this particular news story now? And I'm only thinking about last episode, which yes, you did tell us to delete, but there was a really interesting detail where it seemed as if at the first opportunity, the Pittsburgh Penguins jumped to extend Sidney Crosby we're a week out from July 1st, and now we're hearing that they're nearing an extension. Do, what can you say about what those negotiations could be like or, or anything to that effect? Well, it sounds like I think both sides, I guess, were comfortable uh, with, with just letting it play even another week from free agency. Obviously, we came through a pretty congested period. You know, the, the Penguins front office had lots of time to prepare for the offseason. Their team missed the playoffs, so they had a couple months. But, you know, what just kind of the way it went to – from draft right into free agency where obviously they were active. They made, you know, a trade, you know, trading Riley Smith. Um, you know, I think Crosby was comfortable letting them sort of do that business and then they would get down to, to this business. So, you know, again, you can do that when you, you know, deadlines don't necessarily matter or, or in this case, it was a start line. If everybody at the table is comfortable, I think there can be some different dynamics in, in different talks. You know, it, it does sound like in this case, though, they're both sort of aligned on where this needs to go. And, and now it's about ironing out the final details, ironing out the structure of a contract, maybe even just discussing when's the best time to announce it. Um, you know, I'm about to go on holiday, so hmm. I'll probably announce it just about then. I'm going to learn about it in three weeks, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't sound like there's anything to be read into that too much, but you know, the question does remain Nick, that where that conversation started last week for us is that it, he's been eligible to sign a contract. I think at that point for two or three days, like, why hasn't it happened? I mean, typically, you know, you want to, you want to do the Victor Hedman, right? Tampa announced it, it, they ended up announcing it on July 2nd, but that was because July 1st, they dedicated to saying goodbye to Steven Stamkos. I mean, Julian Brisebois said, first of all, leading into free agency, but also on July 1st, we've basically got a deal done with Victor but we just said, let's put it to the side. And they announced it the morning of July 2nd. But usually with sort of legacy players, you know, it's not that difficult a negotiation. I mean, can you imagine negotiating with Sidney Crosby? I think it, it's akin to, okay, here's a piece of paper. I'll slide across the table. Can you write down your numbers? And then we'll sign it. I mean, <laughs> I don't think there's a lot of hardball. Now, maybe there's probably some nuance there, right? Kyle Dubas is probably explaining to him and his representative, Pat Brisson, you know, here's our plan. This is what we've got committed to players. This is what we want to do. We can fit you in best at that. Like, you know, it's not that Sidney Crosby is holding them hostage. I just think he's in position to, if he cared to. Um, but, you know, obviously he's, he's shown in the past. I don't think money is, is, is driving force. I mean, everyone wants to be paid fairly to what they believe is fair, but um, you know, at the same time, I, I see lots of people always out there saying like, well, at the end of your career, just take 2 million. I mean, when you're still scoring 90 points, like, why would you do that? Uh, do you know how hard it is to make $10 million? I mean, I do, cause I haven't got there yet. And you know, I've been at, I've been at it for a while, but I'm just saying like, you don't, you don't just play for free. I mean, as much as 
I know we want to have this notion. I, and I have no doubt that Sidney Crosby loves hockey more than, or as much as anybody. Uh, this is, he's dedicated his entire life to this, but you know, he should be paid. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't read a whole lot into the timing, but I do think it's best for everyone to settle it because then they'll, they'll, they'll quiet podcasts like ours, uh, pretty quickly. Of course, this would happen immediately after we talk about Sidney Crosby. Of course, this would happen after I let my mind. Well, and producer Nick did. wisely titled the show. Like, like he, he sold yeah. that aspect of our chat. I mean, as any good yeah. SEO manager would, he knows, he knows how we're going to get people in the front door, even, <laughs> but anyway, I own it. We did, we did, we did talk about the possibility of him playing somewhere else. Yeah, it's okay. It happens. Um, to be fair might, though, I might. was saying Colorado, if anywhere else, because I saw someone saying that we were trying to make it about bringing a Canadian guy home. Like this is not, there's no, there was no patriotism in there at all. Um, and I and I think Sidney Crosby is probably among the most celebrated Canadian athletes, despite playing his whole career since age eighteen in Pittsburgh. I assume I don't know this, but I assume he's going to live in Pittsburgh, like Mario Lemieux has most of the rest of his life. Like I, I would expect that that that, that that's home for him, but it doesn't make him any less Canadian in in our eyes. So I, I don't I don't know where that particular criticism was coming from. Yeah, dude could have signed a contract in the KHL for to finish his career. I think we still look at him as one of the greatest to ever play from from our nation. Like, I, yeah, I, I don't, although we I would don't. have probably criticized them for going, yeah, to, yeah, to Russia oh, at this point in time. But, yeah, that's yes. actually a very fair point. Um, he could have signed in Switzerland, and that's uh, actually a much better example. Finished I'm in the National League there, uh, you know, finished up with Zurich, and, and we would have still celebrated him as as one of Canada's great athletes and and ambassadors. I shouldn't have said KHL. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Anyway. You mentioned uh, Crosby likely being on many people's Mount Rushmores. Do you have a Mount Rushmore? Is he on yours? I, you know, the words get it. Yes. I, I'd say yes, he is. But where it's complicated is, you know, Connor McDavid in this last 12 months in particular has, has bolstered his credentials. I mean, it, it, his credentials were already great, but every year you add on, everything you add to the legacy makes, makes it possible that, you know, it, it might be hard to have all of, or some of Gretzky, Lemieux, Bobby Orr, Sidney Crosby. And then if you want to put Connor McDavid up there, you know, then I'm, I'm overlooking Gordy Howe potentially. So if we have like a seven person Mount Rushmore for sure, but it's, it's, it's a little, I'm aware that Connor McDavid will probably be there if he isn't already there. Um, just because the guy's showing no signs of slowing down. You know, if you look at sort of era adjusted points, I mean, he's second to Gretzky all time. And in that sort of category, obviously came very close to lifting the Stanley cup, but you know, would assume his career is going to include some championships either internationally at some point um, or, or with the Oilers. But yeah, I think Crosby, is there. And I think what's, what's great about his career, honestly, I think we celebrated it enough this year, but like not a lot of people were as effective as he is at this age too. Like longevity starts to count into this too, right? Like you're, you're measuring the high water mark, like at his absolute peak, what did he represent? I mean, I don't think there's any question. He was the best player in the NHL at his high, high water mark. Um, you know, the ultimate sort of team leader, you know, he's in addition to the the two cups, the three cups, rather, he's got, you know, the two Olympic gold medals, won a world championship gold. So he's got the triple crown. Like he's, he's got absolutely everything you could want on your resume, more or less. I mean, I'm sure he wants a fourth Stanley cup because when you get three, you want four. And when you get four, you want five, but you know, he's, he's there. And then now if you start to look at the all time scoring list, like he's, he's passing a couple people a season with the great years he's still having. So I think, I think Crosby's there. There's a little bit of a, what could have been aspect to his career. Just to me, like just a little bit, I basically missed a season and a half in his absolute rock and prime, um, which, you know, I guess the thing is it, it would, it would get to where he probably won more heart trophies would have won probably one or two more scoring titles might've won another Stanley cup. Like, like that's, but despite that, I mean, any career is going to have an element of that. Um, very few players and make it through an entire long NHL career without having either a lockout interrupt something or significant injury or both. Um, and so, yeah, he's, that's a long way saying he's on my Mount Rushmore, but 
you know, I am also aware that we're not too far from having the same conversation about Connor McDavid, you know, give him another five years and see what he's able to add to his trophy case and just where his numbers end up. Okay. Well, all's well that ends well with Sidney Crosby, it looks like. And uh, once his contract's done, he can do things like celebrate more with the Canadian men's national soccer team as he did uh, over the weekend. I love that, by the way. I love that celebration with them. That was awesome. I love the win for, for Canada over Venezuela and penalties. But to see Sidney Crosby in the room, that was a fun story. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, it's I, I'm, I'm sort of torn sometimes about nationalism. But I do feel like Canadians kind of stick together and – you do feel something, right? Like, like I will be the first to put up my hand and say 10 years ago, I was not watching Canada's men's national team, soccer team play often. I mean, maybe if it was on TV or something, but you know, obviously with them climbing in the standings, qualifying for the world cup in Qatar, I know it didn't go great, but still like playing more and more meaningful games, you know, it's easy to get excited about it. And, and it's sort of the way I think, you know, going back 20 odd years when Mike Weir won the masters, you didn't have to be a golf fan to kind of feel something as a Canadian to see someone have that achievement or when Steve Nash first won the MVP award in the NBA, like, you know, now it's normal to have a lot of high level Canadian players at, at the top levels of basketball. But back when Steve Nash did that, it, you know, we didn't have, we didn't have a lot of people that could ever be in that conversation. So you, you kind of felt something. And so um, there's just something kind of, I don't know if it's, it's maybe it's a little romantic. I can get romantic about sports. It's, it's a little romantic to have Sidney Crosby, you know, I don't know if you read Josh Cloak's story. He was on a buddy's trip. Uh, he was on a buddy's trip with guys from Ramuski that he goes for a trip every summer with. And they just decided when they saw that the, the men's national team was going to be playing in, in Arlington for that game around, I guess, the time they were going to go, that they decided to go down and that he's there wearing a, you know, the kit and, and in the, in the locker room and everything. So that, that, it just was, it was pretty cool. And I, I'm kind of wondering, like, is he going to show up for Tuesday's game or like, is he, cause he's a superstitious fellow. So does he feel like he needs to be there? I mean, it's not far to go from Pittsburgh. They're playing in New Jersey, right? Or New York. Yeah. They're in New Jersey. So, I mean, easy, easy trip. I hope, uh, I hope 87 keeps a good luck going for team Canada. That's it. Like, could you imagine uh, a man who we talk about patriotism uh, and nationalism? I associate a peak in Canadian sports, nationalism and patriotism with the golden goal of 2010. I don't think more Canadians were ever more united for an event, at least in this century, than that goal, at least in my eyes. And he ends up, I, lo I love the idea, if he does it, if he goes to that Canadian game uh, against Argentina, he goes there, and he's like a Canadian good luck charm. I would love that story. The man has been eating like a peanut butter sandwich before every game for like, whatever, 1200 games or whatever he's played. That's like insane. And I don't know all his superstitions. I remember that's one, and just because I like peanut butter. Shout out peanut butter. But uh, PB and Sid, but uh, you know, like I've just said, he is highly super. Like he he played seventeen seasons with an eight point seven million dollar cap hit, largely because he was born on August seventh, nineteen eighty seven, and that led him to wearing eight seven. Um, I don't know. I I have, I have no insight into this. The problem is maybe they can't announce his contract because he's going to be too busy going to the Canadian men's national team game, and he's going to have to announce it later in the week. That'd be pretty funny. That would be funny. Uh, crunchy or smooth, by the way, with peanut butter? Smooth is my preferred, but I, I like peanut butter in all its forms. I, th I think you win regardless. Anyway. In fact, I was at Cobra Papa's house this weekend, my dad, yes. and my sister's kids were there, and they are in their, they're in their prime peanut butter years, and he had both. And so I put smooth on my toast yesterday morning. Shout out Cobra Papa, man. Yeah, he's, he, hasn't been, uh, he hasn't been around the pod lately. What's he doing? I don't know. He's still listening though. Like every episode. Yeah. Well, Even he yeah. actually, it's cool. My nephew is in sailing camp in Coburg with my dad. So he's staying just, just the two of them uh, for these two weeks. And, and they listened to the last episode together. So oh. shout out Henry. If you're listening to this episode too, with Papa. Of course. Um, this is our last episode before we both go on well-deserved breaks this summer. Um, I normally on Mondays, we do ask CJ and we take in a ton of questions from everyone who listens to the show. We did sort of a mega one on the Thursday. So what I decided to do instead for our last one is a little bit of an exit interview slash season in review. I've got exit interview. Of, yeah. For the season. <laughs> is this like H is HR going to like come in here? Like a, a third box is going to appear and it's Steve <laughs> CJ, you've been fired and here's your exit interview. 
Whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't say that. I mean, for, for the season. Not, it, it, I, I, exit if you could work for the season. You're not I know. Fun. I just associate it with, like, you've left a job and it's your, like, it's, it's your parting gift. Yeah, they'd soon fire me than you. Don't worry about that. No. Um, no, no one's getting no. fired. I'm just kidding around. I know. No one's getting fired. Anyway, uh, these questions, uh, they do dip into this past year, but there are some forward-thinking ones. Just give me as best of an answer as you can for each of these questions. Let's start with this one. What's your favorite story that you wrote from this past season? Ooh. I don't like talking about myself like this. Oh, oh good. Oh, shut up. Just talk about yourself. You're you're but, you're the dude. You're the shit. But you're I will to. say actually this year I'm I was pretty proud of my work. I, I was I thought it went really well at the athletic and you know, you got to do a whole variety of things, which is what keeps me fresh and excited to to do the job. So favorite story. My favorite story might have been, I don't know if you remember this one, but I, I wrote a story about a a men's sort of beer league player, uh Ike Werner was his name in February, who who unfortunately got his his neck cut by a skate accidentally. And they were just happened to be doing that. Um they, he was playing at the Leafs practice rink and the Leafs doctors were there and helped tend to him. And that might have been my favorite if only because it, it certainly had a happy ending. Um, it was a little different. It, you know, for me, like, I'm not saying it's necessarily, I don't know if you can say it's like the best story I wrote, but it, it was different. It was timely. It was relevant with a lot of discussion going on in the game. And, you know, it was really, I was really like, I'm still pretty impressed by Ike. Like I, I went and met with him uh, in downtown Toronto. We had a coffee for that interview. Like I think within a couple of days of this happening and like, his willingness to trust me with the story and to tell it, he ended up going on television after and, and doing some radio uh, because he thought it was so important to, to, to spread the message about wearing neck guards. And so that, that might've been my favorite in that, you know, it, it was so I probably said this on the pod a thousand times, but I, you try to be first best or different with a story. Um, and it, it was a different kind of story. I think it was a relevant story and, and it was outside my comfort zone too, to be honest. I mean, to, to go meet a stranger under those circumstances. He still, you know, his, his neck was bandaged up when we, when we had that coffee to have like a very, I mean, it had to be a heartfelt conversation. I mean, he's, you know, was a, he's a young father and, and you start thinking about everything that could have happened. And so that was probably the favorite story I did. It got great reaction to. Um, and as I say, it's a happy ending. So that that's the most important thing. This next question is a little different from the first one. What was what was the best interview you had this past year? So it didn't have to be an overall story. Maybe you just had a really iconic or hilarious or heart <laughs> for heartfelt interview with somebody. It could be your first answer, but it could be someone else. Yeah, I mean, obviously that interview with Ike would qualify, but I think you know probably when I went to Winnipeg and sat down with Mark Chipman, the owner of the Jets, and and you know he was really kind with his time. We spent I don't know forty five minutes or an hour in his office. And he basically explained all their, their challenges selling tickets this year and, and how they got there, what they were doing to remedy it, you know, re reaffirming the commitment to the marketplace. But that was, you know, that was a relevant story because a lot of us, the Jets had a good season this year. I know they didn't maybe have the playoff success they were hoping for, but you know, they were one of the NHL's top teams right from the get go through most of the regular season. And it's a Canadian market where we know people love hockey and they weren't selling out their building. And, and we also know the margins are a little smaller. It's a smaller market. They have a little less um, corporate support than, than other teams and, and they have a smaller building. So um, yeah, I think that was probably my biggest news making interview, I would say. And, and it was like, it was cool too. I mean, it's not every day, even in my position, you're sitting in an NHL owner's office, you know, having really frank discussion like that one. And, and Mark was pretty trusting of me to, to share everything he shared. And, and, you know, I know that they, they did actually experience a bump in attendance after that story published somewhere in February, or March, wherever it was. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, hope it's not, hope it's not a story we have to retell next year. Hope that, that it was a blip in time, but that's, that's probably my favorite interview. And again, it's most sort of most unique. It, I had no other experiences this past season like that one. What was your favorite CJ show episode or moment from this past season? 
I mean, it's got to be All Star Weekend. I think you know when we did those live shows. Like, I know that that's it. Might be kind of a cop out answer to the question, but like nothing beats a live show. I mean, uh, I think it's always best, Julie, when you and I can be in the same room to do a, an episode, and that just by the nature of where we live and what we do and our other jobs, like it only happens a couple times a year. And then to add an audience element to it, like that was, it's it's like it's just like put it in my veins. Like you just get so pumped. Um, cause I guess on some levels, I mean, most of the time, like I, I'm in the studio at least today, but usually like, I'm just literally like in my little office space, you're in your, you're, you're doing it from your apartment in Calgary, uh, producer Nick's on the line, but like, usually it's, it's, it doesn't feel like there's an audience. Right. But when you're reminded that there are people listening and, and appreciating it and you get to play to the crowd a little bit, I mean, for me, that's, that's gotta be my favorite thing we did this year. It's not to say we didn't have good episodes or funny moments or stupid gags which we which always just come up along the way but i do i do think the live show was my favorite what about you do you have a an episode or are you it's, just gonna it's, say it's definitely the same? The, no but like i mean when this podcast came to be my dream was that we would do some kind of live show in front of people and when the opportunity came to do that at the all-star game in toronto like I don't know if it could get any better than what we did this year. That's going to stay with me for the rest of my life. That's that's one of my favorite things I've ever done in my media career, let alone uh, this podcast. So, yeah, that, that right. has to be the best thing we've done. And I'll say it's obviously a testament to the popularity of the STP. Like what, that too. What Steve and Jesse and Adam have built. But, like, I couldn't believe how busy that room was on back-to-back -back days. Like, I don't know what the final numbers were, but it was packed in there. And in fact, in, in previous iterations of my career, I've actually done shows in that same space. It was never near that busy. Um, so I, I'm not, uh, I'm humble enough to say, I realize it's not just for you and I, but it was so cool to be in a room that busy and with that energy and, you know, what the guys do is awesome. So like, it's just cool to be part of it. And that, it was also neat to see everyone too, right? Yeah. Like they're, like in the little backstage area, everyone's there. Like Tim Haraney's there. Like, like just, you know, like we're all part of the same network, but you know, it's like any job, the athletic, I don't see very many people at the same time. I mean, we all live in kind of a digital world now, but it's cool when we, for me, nothing replaces sort of like face to face human interaction. And that, I mean, let's, let's hope next year, if we can manifest Julian, I don't know where or when it'll be, but we can do something similar. Cause that was fun. I agree. Um, yeah, that just that experience all around. Not to mention, we got to cover the All Star Game. Uh, I don't know how many you've covered in your career. That was my very first one, so that was a very special week for me. I I I look back at that week very fondly. Oh, maybe we'll do a show next year. There's no All Star. It's it's Four Nations tournament. There's ga there's games in Montreal for what. There it's you worth. go. So just, da, 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 da. Uh, just throwing that out there. Um, name a trade slash move you thought would happen, but didn't. Hmm. Most of, uh, I don't know if there was the good one for this one. Just because like, I think back to like, you know, obviously I build those big boards over and over again. Like, I feel like we kind of had it nailed. I mean, maybe someone like Trevor Zegris is a name that was like in the, rumor mill a lot but then even he was injured i mean i'd love to give you like some great story that i've just been sitting on but i don't know if i have a good answer to this one okay sorry that's a little bit yep. of a <laughs> what's the uh the price is right theme when uh someone loses boom boom boom, boom, boom. yeah <laughs> something like that that's okay did you ever watch much price is right or Oh, one of my dreams is to be on that show and like bid on items and maybe play Plinko and get on the showcase showdown. I, I, have, I, I've watched that show a long time. Have you seen the documentary about the person who went on that show? It got no. on a whole bunch of times. Yeah, there's a documentary. I'll message you Which, offline. It's actually pretty entertaining. I can't remember what it's called, but I, I'm sure a Google search could easily find it for us. But it, I watched it and it, it was cool. And it was all about like beating that show. I, I will add that to my list of things to catch up on uh, during the summer. I Cause I will me, definitely watch that. Do you know what I associate it with? I associate it with like the days and I was not, I kind of like, I kind of grew up in the era. It's like, you go to school no matter what. Yep. But if I ever had like a sick day from school, 
I kind of associated it with like being able to watch the prices, right? Cause it used to be on at 10 or 11 or whatever in the morning. And yep. obviously, obviously most of my life I've been tied up at that hour doing school or work. Yeah. So like you were, it was that, um, I think Maury was on like an hour earlier. Like, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> those are two shows like if you have a sick day and you sit in front of the tv those are like two shows you're definitely watching in the what time did jerry springer come on um jerry 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 Jerry. i don't know if i got jerry springer man i I think jerry springer but i might have been too late for jerry springer oh okay well it was it was a more raunchy version of maury oh yes you definitely needed to have your parents not around if you were going to watch that at a certain age yes um, we'll we'll save the reminiscing about shows like Bory and Jerry Springer uh, for. Hey, if not now, then episode. when? I mean, if we have not, had like. <laughs> I was actually remarking to Jesse when we came in here. Like, I never remember a July first where basically everything happened, and then now we're at July eighth, and almost nothing has happened since. Like, it's been yeah. With with respect to the players who have signed, it has been a lot of minor moves. You know, not nothing. You know, the fireworks all happened on Canada Day, July first, and then. Ever, ever since everyone's just been like chilling on the fourth, having stampede time. Like, I feel yes. like the whole hockey world was just like peace. Stampede time. Uh, I, to, I mean, I, I think there, I, there, I've seen a couple hockey media people uh, either fly in uh, or just happen to be around in the city. Stampede's a good time. Have you done stampede in Calgary? I haven't. And I should have, you know, you, you would love it. I know my, you'd love it. My three childhood buddies have lived in Calgary since 2006. Like my three oldest friends from Coburg all lived out and they still live at West. Obviously, I don't think at this point they're moving home 18 years later. But uh, like I've had good friends in Calgary. I've gone out there tons of times in the summer to hang out with them, to golf, to, you know, catch up, go up to the mountains, hike, all that stuff. But I've never timed it well with Stampede. And I should rectify that. I was actually asking my buddy James, who lives in Calgary uh, this week. I'm like, am I too old like to like come out to Stampede for the first time next time or? No, because it does seem like it's pretty like partying is part of the stampede thing. Like, let's just call it as it is. Absolutely. Like, you're not going there just to watch the chuck wagon races or whatever. No, but there are parties geared towards. Olds. I don't know. I've I've been to parties. I've been to parties at stampede where you're seeing like people in our age, in our respective age groups. Yeah. Well, James's response was that you can still tailor your, his opinion is you could tailor an experience towards our age group and still have a good time. Absolutely, so it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been like full 23 year old CJ at stampede. Thank goodness. Uh, but that there's, there's some version of like 43 year old CJ that can, can work out there. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's definitely spaces for that. You should, uh, you should come out next year or is it always right after free agency? Like, is it always right now ish? Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's always right now. So like if this is running to like the 14th, this year you could you could easily pop in for like a couple days hang out go to a couple parties i'm gonna go to like a stampede breakfast and have pancakes and whatever comes with it and then just go for an afternoon nap if that's what you want to do that's what you should do (laughs) as long as you wear a cowboy hat that's what an old man does stampede (laughs) as long as you wear a cowboy hat you're in the spirit um we'll get to a few more of these uh before we wrap up here um i know you can see who voted for who uh, through the PHWA uh, with the NHL awards. Uh, CJ, who was your pick for NHL MVP this year and why? My heart trophy vote went to Nikita Kucherov and he didn't win. So I had no problem with Nathan McKinnon winning. I believe he was second on my ballot. You can fact check that. I haven't looked at it. Since he was because Connor was third. There you go. And for Kucherov, I just thought player a judge to be most valuable to his team. I can't remember the exact percentage, but something like over 50% of the lightning's goals came through his stick, either through an assist or a goal. Um, I thought that this year in particular, the lightning, you know, we were, we have this idea of what the lightning have been. And obviously they're actually going to be a very intriguing team next year because they've changed a lot of what they've been, but mm-hmm. they were not the same team of three or four years ago. And, and they really needed him. I thought to make the playoffs, they played the first 30 odd games without Vasilevsky, even when Vasilevsky came back was not his normal self. And he's obviously been a big backbone of that team success. And so I, I had him as the most viable player to his team, but certainly I have no qualms or issues with Nathan McKinnon actually being the one to, to get the award. I mean, quite honestly, like lots of times I've picked the person who didn't win. 
isn't just this year. I mean, you, I just think you, you do your best job as a voter. Like you, you interpret those each award the way you should. You look at all the relevant facts and you make your vote. And I just, uh, what did Kucherov have? 140 points. I gotta double check the amount of points he had, but he was, he was obviously having an MVP and, caliber. And Braden point was next, right? Like he had like 50 more points in point. I think like he, I mean, those two were, Anyway, I just don't, I don't think it's hard to make the case I, I, and Kucherov finished second. So I had him yeah. first on my ballot. I had McKinnon first on my ballot. You win. And I win nothing. Um, <laughs> if you were NHL commissioner, what's the first thing you would do? Hmm. You could do anything. It doesn't have to be a rule I, change. It could be. I would probably else. change the schedule, but not in the way you're thinking I'm going to say. Okay. Because weirdly enough, my takeaway from this year and everyone experiences it differently, but like having like traveled the whole thing is I kind of liked having the draft and free agency all smashed together. I just think we should smash them together into one big like NHL summer meetings, whatever you call it. But, you know, a number of teams stayed in Vegas uh, after the draft and did free agency from there. Obviously, every agent goes to the draft already. All the you know, a lot of media people go. I would love it if we just had one big festival of like, we just went from the draft. Everyone stayed in that city for another day or two. And we did free agency on the spot. Guys like you and I would be reporting. Oh, we saw Alan Walsh in the lobby with Kyle Dubas. And, you know, maybe they're talking about like, I think it would be cool to have it all together. Um, I realize the NHL is going the opposite direction of this. They're going everything apart. They're saying yeah. everyone just stay in their home cities and we're decentralizing it. But I actually think, it would be cooler. And if I was commissioner, I would have it all happen in one place over, you know, four or five days, which would become kind of a celebration of hockey, you know, TSN, we could do our show from there, like on location at the sphere doing free agency. You could even have the free agents themselves, like get their New Jersey in a sense, yeah. like, like kind of like you see with a player. Like, I think that there's, there's actually weirdly opportunity in that. And let's face it we try not to make too big a deal of this, but like a lot of the deals were cooked and all that. Right. But like, I think you bring back the interview period, but you just have it in that, that place. And so yes. if you're Steven Stamkos, you're in Vegas for two days after the draft, you can interview with the teams like legally, like you can meet with them. I mean, we can report on it. Like, I think, I think that would actually, I mean, hockey does pretty well in that cycle because there's a lot of interesting stuff that happened. And I think that, that, you know, you can just base it on what we see internally at the athletic. Like a lot of our stories were popping at that point in time, yes, but I, I think that I think that you could lean into it and go even bigger. So that weirdly, I'm not going to sit here and say we have to finish the cup earlier, although selfishly that would be better, but like, forget my selfish thing. I actually thought it was cool how it all ran together. I just think we should all do it in one city. Like, why is everyone racing out of Vegas? Like we could have just stayed two more days and had an even bigger celebration of everything going on. Um, I didn't expect to have breaking news pop off during the podcast, but uh, the Washington Capitals are promoting uh, Brian McClellan. Uh, Chris Patrick uh, will be the team's new GM. This is coming from Elliot Friedman just now. All right. There was rumors right. of that. Okay. I mean, Brian's been there a long time. So is Chris Patrick. I think, it, you know, it's a, it's a title change. Probably it's salary bump. Probably, yeah. But like the front uh, office, I think will run probably in similar fashion how it has already. That makes sense. Uh, next one for you. Uh, Leafs fans will be interested in this one. Is Mitch Marner starting next season in Toronto? Yes. I mean, I think I've already said way more likely than not. I just don't see a trade coming, but who knows? I, like, I obviously don't, I can't say with hundred percent certainty, but it feels like he's starting next season in Toronto. Okay. So no I don't know what happens yet. I don't know if they sign an extension. I don't know if we're talking about him trade, getting traded at some point, but I think, you know, it's happened that there's been trades after this point of that significance, but it's pretty rare. Okay. All right. You heard it here. First. And he wants to play in Toronto. So, I mean, that too. He, and he's got a no movement clause. So I think everyone should start to get used to that and we'll probably debate it for the next eight to 10 months. Well, like, I, I wonder though, like there are obviously people who are going to hate this because they feel the way they feel about Mitch Marner. I wonder how Mitch feels about the fact that, yeah, you might want to play in Toronto, but there are a lot of people out there who don't really want you to be there. And I wonder how that shows itself 
through the regular season with their fans. I'm very curious how that plays out. True, but Mitch is he's been around long enough to know how fickle fans can be in both directions. Yes. And I'm sure it's in his mind. I'm going to play so well. They got no choice, but to love me again, not to say people don't love him. I don't, I don't, I, I think that he's become kind of the lightning rod for this entire team, it, but like it's a team's failings, right? It's not like the Leafs inability to progress long into the playoffs. Sure. Sure. Mitch Marner has a hand in it, but so does Austin Matthews, John Tavares, Morgan Riley, um, Sheldon Keefe, Kyle Dubas, you know, I guess we'll say Brad true living, although he's only been there for one year, but like it's, it's not one player or one person's fault. Um, but he sort of becomes kind of like a lot of the energy goes in his direction on this one. But I, I would just say that all, I think, I think people want in Toronto um, is a team that, that wins. Like, I think all will be forgotten. Like, like Ken Holland took a whole bunch of arrows for a number of years in Edmonton. I didn't hear anyone complain about Ken Holland on that cup run. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying it smooths everything over. There's still someone who probably point out the Jack Campbell contract that they just bought out or whatever. But if, if you win, it doesn't matter how you got there. And so I, I would guess without having spoken to Mitch, his focus is on having a great season, you know, getting to work under Craig Berube. And if the Leafs win, all the noise will just have been just that, just, just, it's it, it was it's all the crescendo up to the great moment, uh, which is not me predicting the Leafs are going to win. But I, if you're a player for the team, like of course you're that's your goal, that's what you're working towards. Yep, I like that answer. Uh, three more for you here. Is mm-hmm. Utah Yeti a good name for the Utah Hockey Club? I don't know why you change a perfectly good name like Utah Hockey Club. I agree. I you think know that I've been a spectacular in, name. You and I have been in on this from the ground floor. Like I was saying this when it was just one of the. 24 options or whatever they had on the original long list. I like it. I, and and now it sounds weird because it's supposed to be just this one year, this one season they're using it, but like, we're already getting used to saying it. Like people are going to say Utah hockey club. Like, you know, someone is going to be reading the highlights on TSN sports center in October and, you know, say, Hey, Mikhail Sergachev scored the first goal in Utah hockey club history, or, or maybe we'll start calling it Utah HC. I don't know if it'll get, you know, trim down a little bit there, but I'd call it Utah HC. That makes, that makes perfect sense. Right. But I'm just saying I, I wouldn't change that, but it does seem like Yeti has all the momentum and, and I will live with Yeti, but I would prefer, uh, I would prefer it was Utah HC. I, I just think they already have the right answer. Uh, if, uh, Mikhail Sergachev is in fact the first goal scorer in, uh, Utah HC history, uh, please make sure this part of the podcast is isolated and we share that out on socials so we can say we were right. Yes. Um, Although if I could go back in time, I'm going to say Josh Doan just because there's something, something cool about the idea of like the, the, the passing of the torch from one Doan to the, the next place. I like that answer too. Uh, does producer Drew have this top five center list right? Uh, he put out a whole bunch of different top five lists lists over the weekend Here's his top five centers right now. You know, I always have in such a good weekend. I didn't see one of his top five lists. And I do follow Drew, but I like literally was that little time on Twitter. Here's this one. Uh, McDavid, McKinnon, Dreisaitl, Matthews, Crosby. Yeah, I like it. So like, I don't, uh, I don't have much to, to amend there. I mean, obviously we could debate, but I, I, I think he's got that one pretty locked in. What about uh, Sasha Barkov? Should he be on that list? I don't know. Maybe fifth. I like look at he's an amazing pl- like to say someone is the fifth best in the world or something is not a slight. But no. he he certainly has never produced points at the rate of those players uh, above him. I know there's way more to the game than points, and he gets celebrated a lot for his defensive play. So it would have been like Selkie winner. Just won I guess a Stanley you. Cup, shut but down a lot of the league's best players en route to doing that. It's fair, but where would you have ever put Patrice Bergeron in his prime? Like, he would have had trouble being ahead of the Crosbys. And, like, he was an amazing player and, and a cup winner in his own right and, like, won whatever. We basically renamed the Selkie Award the Bergeron Award in, those, in that era. I mean, it, I guess it depends what you're measuring. The beauty of any list. The beauty of any list is we could definitely, we could raise like four more players, I think too, and be like, whoa, Jack Eichel slighted. 
or pick someone. But I, I'm, I'm reasonably okay with that list that Drew put out. And of course, okay. he put Crosby there because he still dreams of him in an AF sweater. I understand that. Well, producer Drew, congratulations. You got something right. Uh, who's winning the cup next season? Nashville. Oh, you're going Nashville. I love it. I love it. And then you got a little mini Stanley Cup there, too. There we go. Why Nashville? I, I mean, usually winning free agency is a bad thing, right? But I I actually, like, they literally added two first-line players. And they added a difference-making defenseman in Brady Shea. And it's it's going to sound like a stretch to someone out there. But I think the, we can't overstate the fact that they have difference makers at every position. And, you know, where they might be like a little bit weak for, for a top tier contender is down the middle. Um, you know, Ryan O'Reilly was their first line center last year, which is nothing against Ryan O'Reilly. But I think at this stage of his career, you preferably have him in the number two spot. But like when you have Roman Yossi and Brady Shea and UC Soros, and Ryan O'Reilly and Philip Forsberg and Marcia So and Stamkos. I mean, they have they have a really intriguing recipe. Now, those players, someone might rightly point out, like that's that's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, rosters in the league. You, you know, we, you you have wonder, you have questions per, perhaps about how durable they'll be. Will injuries derail their season in some way, shape, or form? But I just I think it's an intriguing mix, and I love what they did on free agency day. So. You know, I was going to really like my heart truly says Edmonton's going to win. I, I really liked Edmonton's off season. They came one goal, two goals away from winning the Stanley cup this, this year. But I felt like that would be a more boring answer. I'm going to, I'm going to go with Nashville and stick with Nashville. And you know, what a storyline that would be. I'm always cheering it. for the story too. You know that. Yeah, I know that you, you're very much on that. I love that answer. And uh, you uh, did amazingly well through. Who are you uh, picking? I mean, I can't be the only one to put, Put a way too early cup pick out there. Dallas. Hard to argue I like, that. I like Dallas. I, 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 They were my pick entering the playoffs this year. I don't think they lost that much blood. And I think with the young players, the, the nucleus they're developing, they could still be a contender for quite some time. I think Dallas gets one next year. Right. See, like Nashville is the easier answer because I can point to things they added. You can just say like Dallas gets another kick at the can, but Wyatt Johnson's a year older. Like, and, and, Quite honestly, they got to the Western Conference final game six as it was like they just need maybe another shot at it with the same team. But yeah, I think, well, that'd be fine. You don't have Chris Tanev anymore, but like you still have Ottinger. You still have Wyatt Johnston. You still have Jason Robertson. Joe Pavelski out of the there. room, too. It'll, like there'll be there'll be a shift there, like You're leadership right. wise and everything. I'm not but You're I'm not right. predicting a downfall. I I'm with you. I think Dallas. I mean, Dallas, Nashville, Edmonton, Colorado, the best four teams in the West, maybe Vegas. I don't know. Vegas. It's hard to know where Vegas is, like yeah. losing Chandler Stevenson, losing Marcia. So you wonder, does Vegas still have a big trade up their, their sleeve? Like, is that going to be the move I miss when I'm not paying attention on my vacation? Also, Brian Suter also not going to be on Dallas as well. They bought out his contract. You're right. There's some older veterans who aren't going to be there, but like, like, like Jimmy Ben and, and Tyler Sagan could still make up some of that veteran presence. I think, I don't know. I, I like them getting younger at, at both of those positions if they can as well. I don't know. I, I I think Dallas is the pick. All right. Go Preds. And uh, Vegas, if Vegas makes a move, I mean, it would be very on brand. I've covered Las one Vegas. Stanley Cup on Broadway, and I don't know if I'd survive a second. <laughs> <laughs> Broadway is a crazy time, especially if you're going to Tootsie's by the end of the night. Um, Yeah, I think that's it for the uh, season in review portion. Uh, again, you did very well with the questions. And we are at the end of this CJ show, our last one before we go off on break. We will do some drop-ins in the summer. Uh, we'll figure those out as we plan. But, uh, well, another great year doing this podcast, man. I'm, I'm really grateful uh, for all the experiences we've had this past season. I know there, there I know for me there have been some ups and downs, but uh, being able to do the show um, has been just an amazing time, and I'm really grateful to – work with you and, and producer Nick and, and producer Drew and the rest of the SDPN team at making the show what it is. So um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say those things uh, before I give you the last word. Thanks buddy. You're the best. This is so much fun. Three years is kind of crazy. Three full seasons. Uh, still going strong. And yeah, we'll be back in August at some point. Um, but 
I got to, I got to put my gone fishing sign up on the, on the door for the next couple of weeks and then we'll, uh, we'll recuperate, but can't wait for year four, my friend. We, uh, we're going out in style. Yes, sir. Yeah. We've had these sunglasses ready. A vacation is very needed. Uh, we'll be back when we're back. Uh, thank you to everyone who subscribed to the podcast. Thank you to everyone who watches the show on YouTube or listens on Spotify, Amazon, Apple, wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, we appreciate you, 100 percenters, or even if you're trying to get to 100 percent. We appreciate even the 23 percenters. We love you. We love you. Take your time, man. Get to that number. <laughs> it's all good. You can get there. You have a whole bunch of weeks to get to 100% if you want to. If you don't want to, that's cool, too. Just tune in when you can tune in. Uh, we'll be back with, I guess, season four uh, properly in the fall. But also, again, you never know what could happen this off season and when we might drop in. So uh, be on the lookout for our episodes. For CJ, I'm Julian. So long. Enjoy your summer. The Chris Johnston Show. Inside the game twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at Reporter Chris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JK and McKenzie. The Chris Johnston Show.